Romans chapter 5 says that through the one man, Adam, sin entered the world. It had devastating consequences. But it goes on to say that through the one man, Jesus Christ, perfect in his humanity and yet never diminishing his deity, he stepped in for you and me. He stepped into the place and bore our sin. It's what Easter was all about. It's not just a holiday, but a truth. He died for our sins. He rose again so that now grace just overwhelms the impact of sin. And whosoever that calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. It's the heart of Jesus that none would perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And that everlasting life comes to you and me as we put our faith in his grace. Now, when you read Romans 5 and you see the magnitude of sin, but the greater power of grace, it helps us to understand why Romans 6 would start with a question. Now, I normally read from the NIV or the New Living Translation. I love the NASB. But today, because of the wording that the message paraphrase uses, I want you to hear this, and we're going to take it together. Now, I'm going to read a large portion of Scripture. I have been told when it comes to preaching that if you read large portions of Scripture, you may lose people's attention. I've never agreed with that. What I'm about to read is the most important thing I'll say all day, which is the Word of God. And it is, it is so active, it is so relevant, it is so powerful, and I pray that it just finds your mind and heart with a fresh impact today. This is Romans 6, message paraphrase. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and we left for good? This is Paul saying in Romans in a different way of what he said in Corinthians, that when you get saved, old things pass away and all things become new. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Peter said, when we get saved, you come out of darkness into this, he calls it marvelous light. Here, Paul says, it's like that was your old house, your old life, but you don't live there anymore. By grace, you have packed up and you left for good. This is what happened in baptism. When we, sent, uh, when we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. So you, you see the transition. He's emphasizing that salvation matters, that salvation will not leave you uh, the way it found you. You will be changed. Water baptism is referenced here as a great illustration. Water baptism won't save you. You get saved, and then you get baptized in water to give a witness in an outward way of what has already happened in your heart. And when you go into those waters, the old is passing. When you come out, it's symbolic. It is a witness that the new life is what you're walking in. It is phenomenal. And I'll just pause right here. What is our latest number now over the weekend? We've had, by the end of this service, be 32 people that are following in being baptized in water. Isn't that amazing? Some of them were baptized in the first service, and I gave an opportunity. I said, hey, if right now you didn't even come prepared, but after hearing this message, you want to be. And, and a lady who's a senior adult comes out of her seat, and a young man who was 16 came out of his seat and got added to the number that were baptized this morning. I'm going to skip it down to verse 12. 
What all this means is that you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. This is where Paul is saying, we are going to so fall in love with Jesus that we're going to recognize sin at the smallest stage, at the infant stage, sin in seed form. We're going to recognize the importance of what happens when it starts there. We're not just going to be aware of the major consequences of full-blown sin. We're going to be aware of the very appearance of evil, and we're not going to run after these little errands that are connected to that old way of life. Here's what we're going to do. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full-time. Remember, you've been raised from the dead. So throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full-time into God's way of doing things. The way you and I will hate sin is because we love Jesus. And the way that we grow and are transformed is because we're going to go wholeheartedly. We're going to throw ourselves into this like we're thankful to be saved. We're thankful that Jesus would die for us. We're thankful that he would bear every sin. We're thankful that he wants a relationship with us. And so we will gladly throw ourselves into this full time, wholeheartedly. And that is the very best way to keep from running after every little invitation to compromise. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. Paul is saying, as you look back over your history, if there's been a lot of alcoholics, alcoholism has just had its way in your family line, and a grandfather, a great-grandfather, a father was that way, it's tried to make its way into your life. When you get saved, you don't live under the old tyranny any longer. That's the power of grace. You are living in the freedom of God. So since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we can live any old way we want? Since we're free in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that actually destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. Like, that's because sin wants control. Sin wants control. Sin is about addiction. It is about slavery. But offer yourselves to the ways of God, and the freedom never quits. This is amazing. All your lives, you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time the more you did what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had. This is Paul just getting so real with us about how it really works. And now, think about how much different it is now as you live in God's freedom. Your lives healed and expansive in holiness. As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? What did you get out of it? Nothing you're proud of. Where did it get you? A dead end. But now that you've found you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do and have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, oh, what a surprise. A whole, healed, put-together life right now with more and more life 
on the way. Work hard for sin your whole life, and your pension is death. But God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our Master. Romans chapter 6. Wow. Thank you, God, for your word. Live into that. Consider that. Meditate on that. This is what he's saying is that grace is so powerful that your past, because of grace, loses its ability to influence your future. It is that strong. So, has your past lost that grip? Has the guilt, the shame of the past lost that grip? If not, just move, move in deeper in this relationship with Jesus because grace is about freedom, like total freedom. Like the past has no, law, no ability or authority to, to call you back to who you were. You're not who you were. You are this new person and you're living in the growing uh, expansive holiness of God. We all hear that hurting people hurt people. But when you get saved, hurt people can find healing. And then what happens in Christianity is that hurt people get healed and start helping people. It's not hurt people keep hurting people. No, there's grace for that. There's healing for that. And so we don't have to be who we were. We don't have to do what we've always done. This is so powerful that you can live in this freedom of only needing the approval of God. All you need is the affirmation of God. More than ever, there is a challenge to what I call an approval addiction. People watching so carefully how many likes they get on a given post on social media. People who may never have been affirmed as a child, as a teenager, and they find themselves doing so much because they, they want and need that approval out of that brokenness of the past. But what Paul is saying is that if you come into a relationship with Jesus, grace is so profound. Grace is so good that you will find yourself healed from the impact of not getting that kind of affirmation from the people who should have been saying it you still can live in the freedom where you don't wake up every day maneuvering and posing and posting to get that approval because you don't need that anymore because you have the approval of the very one who created you, the one who knew you before he formed you. And you don't go to bed looking over your shoulder. You don't wake up in this anxiety. You wake up in the approval of the very grace of God in your life. That's freedom. That's freedom. So to live it out, to live it out, Paul is saying you got to realize that you, you, you're not who you were. So take sin seriously. In fact, he's getting at the idea of hating sin. If I don't hate it, I won't leave it. And I'll not hate it just as a defensive measure, what's going to empower my, my ability to hate sin is my love for Jesus. What Paul is showing us here is that you're not saved into religion where you get a list of do's and don'ts, and now by sheer discipline, you try to say no to all of that and yes to all of this. You're saved into a relationship. Nobody hated religion. More than Jesus. It destroyed people. It demoralized people. Jesus saves us and invites us into a relationship. And as you grow in that relationship, the freedom keeps expanding. The capacity of God is open to you. And as you grow in that love for Jesus, you start picking up this alertness to sin in its seed form. Let me show you how sin works. Starts with a desire. That desire will be met with a deceptive temptation of the enemy of your life to satisfy that desire in a sinful way. At that moment, you have an opportunity to disobey. 
It's called sin. If you disobey, at first, because sin starts small, if, if the temptation came and you were shown the devastating consequences of sin, no one would do it. Satan crops that out of the picture. And he only shows you the enjoyment, the fun, the high, the pleasure side. He's going to hide the devastating consequences. And if you disobey, and then you keep disobeying because your mind says, hey, I'm managing this. No one knows. I'm not hurting anybody. And you keep crossing that line, and you keep crossing that line. You find yourself delighting in it. You go back to it. But you end up not being able to do a day without it. And now the game has changed. Now it has you. And over a spiral of sin, you end up at the bottom. And we have watched so many people. Maybe you've experienced in your own life. I know what sin has done in my life. We've watched sin be a thief of someone's testimony, someone's dignity, someone's freedom, someone's marriage, someone's career. It's, and, and if we saw that at the beginning, no one would ever cross the line. Today's challenge is to so fall in love with Jesus that you become alert to sin at the infant stage that you don't even need to see the consequences. And this is the critical part of this message. When you start these subtle and small compromises, even then you feel this uniqueness and difference in your relationship with Jesus. And I want us to be so in love with Jesus that we would not even allow that. We don't want to just avoid the devastation. We don't want to taint. We don't want to mess up in the smallest way this incredible relationship with the one who saved us. That's the key. The Bible says flee the appearance of evil. Who even thinks about the appearance of evil unless you are willing to consider sin when you don't feel all the consequences? When you're not seeing where it could go? When you are thinking this is no big deal? The way we consider how big a deal it is even when it's small is because we're so in love with Jesus that we recognize, oh, I, I see what this is about and there's not a chance I'm going to entertain that because I don't want that preach. I don't want that disconnect in my fellowship with Jesus. I'm not saying he won't love you. I'm saying you feel the difference when you're living in compromise in your relationship with Jesus. So when you read the Bible, when I was reading that scripture, my, my goal for all of us would be read the Bible to love Jesus more. Worship to love Jesus more. Come to church not just because it's a great thing to do. Come to church as a way of adding this experience to your life to love Jesus more. Get in community to love Jesus more. I didn't read today so we would have more information. I read so we would love Jesus more. Because we're talking about what he did for us. Talking about what it is now for us who know Jesus. And if we do all of this to love him more, that's relational. And that's the very empowerment to see sin for what it is, even when it's small. John said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I don't know how you've heard that all of your life. There was part of my life I heard that as it, it, it came across to me as religious until somebody helped me and said, no, read it again, read it again, read it again. If you love me, relationship, relationship with Jesus is the power for obedience. Relationship. I love what Jeremiah says. He says, those who seek God will find God when they seek him with their whole heart. 
That's my call. Being a pastor now for 33 years, if we don't go all in, we just are, are going to live a life so beneath what Scripture offers, so beneath what Jesus saved us to know, so beneath the, the influence we could have. And I think on a day of water baptism, there's no better illustration of all in. The word baptism in the Greek is baptismo, and it means immersion, to be surrounded, to be enveloped. That is the very essence of Romans 6. Go all in, full time, wholeheartedly. We're giving ourselves to this relationship. We're immersing ourselves in this relationship with Jesus. All in. Water baptism, it's, it's all in. Be immersed in it. I believe that all he is is found when we are all in. All he is is experienced when we are all in. Think about the verse. Don't let it rush over us too quickly. Jeremiah says that if we seek God, we will experience the totality of God when we seek him with our whole heart. When we go all in, we experience all he is. As these people are enveloped by the water, Paul is saying, you will be enveloped by the presence of Jesus, by that relationship, the power of Jesus, when you go all in. I'm wearing my wedding ring today. I never take it off. A wedding ring, it doesn't make me married. It's a sign I'm married. Water baptism doesn't save anybody. It's a sign that they are saved. Imagine somebody that's uh, moving toward marriage, but they say to their fiance, hey, um, you know, I'm with you. It looks like we're going to get married. However, I don't want to change my status on Instagram or Facebook. <clears throat> I'm going to need a drink of water on that. <laughs> I'm saying, look, um, I don't really ever want to wear a ring. Let's just keep it on the down low. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's a person who's like, hey, we're married. I don't want anybody to know. That's a person that's got so much hesitation. Just how much all in this are they going to have? in that relationship. I mean, when it comes to marriage, I wish we had wedding rings on every finger. Mary! <laughs> because when you say yes to that person, you're saying no to everybody else. And water baptism is an all-in kind of thing, and Jesus used that to describe Christianity as all-in. It's the wedding ring of Christianity. So these people, when they get baptized, they are saying, want everybody to know, I have said yes to Jesus. And my yes to Jesus is my no to Satan's desire for my life, my future, my talent, my time. My yes is also my no. I, my yes is I am in love with Jesus, and I'm going to hate anything that would try to threaten this relationship. So take that. Just go all in. Go all in. And, and I got emotional last night uh, talking about this because I felt like when I was saying, let's go all in, I felt like I was presenting Jesus like a car salesman, trying to talk you into it. Are you kidding? The one who died in our place bore all of our sin. And we're like, you know, I said a prayer, but I'm never wearing the ring. I'm not changing my status. I'm going to keep my relationship. 
on the down low. I'm not really all in. Like, I, I like it because I don't want to go to hell. I preach to you a Jesus who loved you so much that he gave his life for you gladly. And what an honor for sinners like us to be able to call out out of no merit of our own. Just calling out in desperation and surrender and saying, Jesus, will you save me? And he does. And he invites us in a relationship with him into the totality of all that he is. And all that he is is found at the address of all in. Let's go all in.